Okay, thank you very much indeed and welcome to the final panel session of what has been, in my view, a brilliant conference today. I think the range of contributions that we've had from up here, but also from the audience, particularly from the student panel, has been really um, refreshing and exciting. I'm Alison Peacock, I lead the Chartered College of Teaching. So it's going to fall to people like me to work really closely with our profession, to build a sense of energy around future proposals. A profession that at the moment, as I'm sure you can agree with me, may feel quite beleaguered. So we need to find reasons for hope and optimism and I hope that the panel that we have, um, the final panel of this conference, will give us some of that. So I'm going to hand over to them to introduce themselves and I'd like to start with Wayne if we could and then come this way. If you could introduce yourself and say what you do but also why you're here, why does it matter to you, why is this a, a topic for consideration and the, the focus of our panel is to think about, there's been lots of talk about exams going online and about the use of new technology um, in assessment, both formative and summative. So we're going to talk about this whole issue um, across the panel and really with the advent of the latest AI um, interventions in terms of you know, potentially uh, the computer writing your answer for you, we need to kind of embrace that as well. So starting with you, Wayne, if you could introduce yourself and say why you think you might be here. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm Wayne Holmes. I'm an associate professor at University College London. Um, my subject is a, a critical theory approach to artificial intelligence and education. Um, I'm not a computer scientist. I'm a social scientist. And I'm really interested in the ways in which um, these tools are being used, um, are increasingly being used in educational settings. Um, and I'm you know, really quite cynical, I have to say, about um, many of these issues um, and the ways in which um, particular technologies are being uh, allowing education to become a commercial operation rather than what I believe it should be. Um, so um, a lot of people have heard uh, recently about um, a piece of software that was made available um, in November. It's actually a piece of software that's been around for a while. It's called ChatGPT. And everyone's scared because of the ways in which this technology can generate uh, writing. So a student theoretically could enter um, an essay title and the, the, the software can suddenly generate um, an essay. Um, and so universities we were just talking are you know, really worried about this. How is this going to affect? And one of the things that I think is really important is not to think, well, how does this technology um, do the things that we do? but rather how can we use this technology to support um, what we're interested in and to support um, the ways that we can move forward in productive and useful ways. So, um, but to answer your, your question, Alison, about why am I here, I'm here because um, I've been in education all my life, education technology for a long time, um, and I believe in assessment and I believe in accreditation. I also believe in teachers and I don't believe um, that the technologies that we have at the moment um, can do uh, much of what um, is said they can do. Um, but there are possibilities for the future, but we've got a long, long way to go. Thank you very much. Gabrielle? Hi, I'm Gabrielle Finn, Professor of Medical Education and Vice Dean for Teaching, Learning and Students in the Faculty of Biology, Medicine and Health at the University of Manchester. I have the dubious honour of leading some cross-institutional research groups um, looking at the use of optionality in assessment and at Manchester I'm in charge of a group called Assessment for the Future where we're trying to look at returning the best practice that was developed during the pandemic, um, keeping a mind on inclusive assessment and trying to address our differential attainment and awarding gaps simultaneously. So I think I'm here to champion for inclusive assessment. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Tom? Yeah, hi, I'm Tom Richmond. I'm the founder and director of EDSK. Uh, we're an education think tank. Uh, we cover schools, colleges, apprenticeships, universities, and much more besides. In terms of why I'm here today, we've written three major reports over the past 18 months or so on the future of assessment 
in England. We've looked at two reports, produced two reports on secondary assessment and accountability, I should say. We did put the two together. That might come out in the conversation today. Two reports on secondary assessment and accountability, and then one on primary assessment and accountability. We talked a lot in those reports and indeed proposed that the government should introduce digital technology into the assessment landscape at a much greater pace and scale than they have now. But the question for us was not whether we could just do assessment differently, but whether we could do assessment better with digital technology. To give you an example, we could try to just swap pen and paper GCSEs for GCSEs being completed on a computer. We could do that. That is possible, and it is being trialled now. But the question for us would be, does that really make much of a difference to the learner? Does it make much of a difference to teachers, parents, and indeed to government ministers? And so for us, it's always a question of, can we use technology to give us something that we don't already have and to push our knowledge of how well students are progressing and attaining further, rather than just saying we could move from A to B, can we actually do it better in the future? Thank you very much. And last but not least, Mary, would you like to talk to us? Yeah, please? thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Mary Kernock Cook, and I chair the, um, Pearson's UK qualifications business. Um, I'm completely post-executive now. In other words, non-executive. So I've got um, board positions across uh, quite a lot of different education and ed tech uh, businesses. Um, I think I should stress that I'm neither an academic nor an educator, and I come at these things more from a kind of system and implementation point of view. Um, so I'm very interested in the, for example, in qualifications generally, but particularly the currency for qualifications, you know, how, the, how they help people progress, what barriers there are for people to get through the system. So I, I, I love hearing all the creative ideas that are talked about, but I immediately go to how practical would this be to deploy and implement in England, let's just say only England, let alone the rest of the UK, which is a very large and very complex uh, system. So that's, that's kind of my frame of um, thinking. Having said that, um, in, uh, I have previous, by the way, as Chief Exec of UCAS, and some of you might be old enough to remember the QCA, the Qualifications and Curriculum Authority. Um, but I first got involved in e-learning, as it was then called, in the late 90s, which is a very long time ago. And by the way, I took an entirely digitally delivered and digitally marked test called GMAT, when I applied for business school over 20 years ago. So I have to confess, I also come from a rather frustrated point of view that we haven't made more progress in, let's call it, technology-enhanced education, teaching and learning, but also um, assessment. I, when I was at the QCA, I, I, I remember writing a speech for the then chief exec, Ken Boston, that some of you might remember, in, I think it was 2004, and in this speech, um, we called for the first, I think we called them e-GCSEs to be delivered by 2009. Um, and here we are in 2023 uh, with not a lot of progress made. So I kind of, I'm frustrated from Oxfordshire. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So um, my first question to the panel is, what do you see as the place of digital technology in assessment. I mean, presumably, we don't just want exam halls where everybody files in and sits at a terminal instead of picks up a pen. So how can we use this as a nudge towards a, a rethinking of assessment? What's the place of digital technology? If I come to you first, Wayne. I don't think we're in a place where we can do that yet, particularly effectively, not with the, the um, technologies like AI. Um, there's a lot been said about what AI can achieve, what it can do. And I read a, um, an interesting um, academic paper on the way in today, um, which um, summed up all the different ways in which um, AI is being used across assessment. And the reality is it, it's so superficial. Um, so can it be used to do some superficial things? Yeah, probably. Can it replace um, a, a person who can read um, what's, been read, what's been written and give um, 
an, uh, feedback or assessment of the same standard. I, I just don't believe it can. So I think um, it's important that we keep exploring these ideas, but at the moment we need to really think very carefully before we start implementing them. And one of my other hats is working for the Council of Europe, and we've just put together a report with the pithy title AI in Education, a critical view through the lens of human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. And in that report, we've identified many different ways in which the use of technology such as AI, but also um, data more generally, um, in schools, in education, in assessment, actually really starts to compromise human rights quite dramatically. So yes, I think we should keep exploring, but I don't have any um, ideas of what we can be doing today. Gabrielle? Coming from an institution with 48,000 students, I think my take on digital assessment is quite a practical solution. Um, we, we want to encourage blended learning, distance learning, more autonomy for our learners. So for me, technology enhanced learning offers that. It's not just, not just the learner experience that's important for us. It's, you know, we've got UCU strikes. We've got an assessment boycott coming up in April. Palpitations are starting. There's the pragmatic side for our staff as well, in that once we embrace technology in our assessments, then it reduces marking burden. People can dip in and out. There's, not, we're not, there's less risk with security, with research papers. But it's also for students, is the real world nature of it. People panic when we talk about open book online assessment, that students have access to materials. When in the real world do we not? I've, I presume pretty much everyone in this room has a device of some sort and everyone's sitting next to someone that they could ask for advice. I teach medical students. I absolutely want them to be able to prescribe and get a drug dose calculation correct on their own. I don't want them to kill somebody by giving you know, milligrams and micrograms and mixing it all up. That absolutely we need to be able to trust that they can do on their own. But embracing more open book, authentic real world assessment through digital platforms, for me, I think, prepares them for the real world. So I'd like to see it implemented. And hopefully before 3009. Yeah, thank you. Tom. Yeah, I think there's three big problems that I think technology can make a really big impact on. The first of them, all three have come up today in all the various sessions, I should say. The reliance we have on one-off exams is something that came up in the youth panel that some of you may have listened in uh, to earlier. If we want to check what pupils know and understand, if we want to see what progress they've made, relying on a single test of that, a single check over the, after what can be years and years of education, seems like a very odd approach if we really genuinely want to see what's happening. The second point is that I think the current system we have is quite poor at not just diagnosing which pupils might need more support but also diagnosing which schools might need more support, either resources from government, support from other schools nearby. That's a bit of a black hole. If we wait all this time for a single one-off test, we can potentially miss out on some opportunities to help intervene with pupils and schools. And thirdly, I think the current system can be very distracting. So for those of you familiar with primary education in state schools in this country, there are currently five statutory tests in seven years of primary education. That is very distracting for head teachers and teachers who want to focus on teaching and learning and want high standards, but they're always having the, the accountability system is always pulling them in different directions. So where does technology fit into that? Well, in our reports that we've written at EDSK, we've unashamedly called for a switch away from one-off pen and paper tests towards online adaptive testing. Going back to Mary's point about frustrations, I was writing reports in the, the mid to late 2000s on how adaptive testing, these tests that can adapt and get easier and harder as the test is going along to match people's ability and be a really personalised form of assessment. It's been around for 20 years, if not longer. That kind of technology is appearing all over the place around the world and has been used extensively. Denmark, we found that since 2010, all national tests for primary and lower secondary pupils have been online and adaptive format. Reading, maths, geography, the sciences for over a decade. In Australia, which has been mentioned a few times today, we found that their national assessment program, reading, writing, language, numeracy from ages eight to 15, all now moved 
online. Wales, again, has come up to the, in conversation today. They've just moved away from all of their pen and paper assessments to online adaptive testing from years two to nine. So to say we're behind the curve would be an understatement. This has been around for a very, very long time. The technology has been shown to work well, and it really can help solve some of what we think are some quite underlying problems. There are some issues around digital inclusion and fairness, which still need to be tackled. Is it fair to get all kids to sit tests on a computer? Well, some will have more access to devices, etc. Those are good and important questions. But ultimately, you know, we think over the next five years, and we have recommended this to, to government and op opposition parties, we think you can move in this direction to get better information about students, better information to parents, better information to teachers to help diagnose those who might need more support and even whisper it, maybe even better for government ministers who care about high standards as well, because they'll be able to see how well pupils are progressing across the country, which we think is a good thing. So we think there is a role now, for a very tangible role, which, yes, it will take time to get there. Implementation, clearly a big challenge, but it's doable. It has already been done. Mary? Yeah, well, uh, leaving aside my um, GMAT test of 20 years ago, of course, in the adult world, digital assessment is commonplace virtu virtually every day, whether that's assessing uh, customer satisfaction, whether it's attitudinal surveys, pre-screening for interviews and internships for professional knowledge development, um, online degrees and micro-credentials, and, and indeed some very high stakes testing of professional competence in, in some areas. Um, but so here we are, as we've all said in different ways, with very little digital assessment in the compulsory education phase, which I think is a real shame because quite apart from anything else, every young person coming out of school or college when they're 16 or 18 is going to face a world in which they will have to engage with digital learning and indeed uh, digital assessment. So I would say it's actually an important life skill to be able to do uh, assessment online and, and to be able to uh, cope with that. Um, now, of course, our current system, the, the written pen and paper exam system, was, was clearly designed in an analog um, world, um, certainly many decades, if not cent centuries ago. Um, so I, I was really pleased in the, in the last year or so um, at Pearson, they've been able to take some, what I think are really bold steps, albeit just putting the analog into a digital format, which I think is a reasonable first step for this journey that we need to go on. So last uh, summer, Pearson delivered live IGCSEs in English um, for about 600 students in uh, international schools to huge success. Uh, the pupils absolutely loved it. The teachers absolutely loved it, not least because they got fantastic data back about how their pupils performed, you know, at a pupil level, at a question level. You could see, oh, everyone didn't do quite so well on question five. Where have we fallen down in the uh, curriculum delivery for that? Also, the um, Pearson GCSE, the, the, the nine-grade nine GCSE in computer science, one of the papers there is now online um, and I think there were about 2,000 um, students who, who did that last summer so that feels like big progress. In, incidentally the IGCSE is, is now um, this year will be available to, to all comers of IGCSE and I think um, there's already about 2,000 entries for the, for the option of going for the on-screen uh, paper. Um, but of course that's all a little bit the wrong way around because we should be designing assessments um, that make use of the kind of full range of technological tools to make them engaging and interesting, even, even fun. You know, who, who ever heard of an, a school assessment being fun um, but critically valid uh, and reliable as well? Um, and I think the opportunity over time, and I do think it needs to be a careful journey, is to move away from the kind of mass single sitting, you know, 23rd of May, everyone sits down in the school hall and does their GCSE in, in maths, for example. I think we need to move away from that single sitting, high stress, mass examination to something much more flexible, um, perhaps when ready, um, and using all the kind of security features that tech uh, enables, which you can't get with the pen and paper analog um, system. 
I, I should also mention two other important things. One, one is the cost um, of the analog system. I think there are significant cost savings to be realized throughout the education system of beginning to move um, to digital assessments. But also, the green agenda, which as you know, is not only top of most political parties' minds at the moment, but certainly for our pupils is, is very much front of mind. Now, I have been to Hellaby, which is the Pearson um, pro exam processing plant uh, in, uh, in Yorkshire. Is it in Yorkshire? Yes, it is in Yorkshire. You, I'm, going to, I'm going to get in real trouble for my Pearson colleagues, but I'm going to issue an open invitation. If anybody wants to come and see what we're doing, there is a warehouse, because you have to keep the physical scripts for six months. There is a warehouse, it's not quite as big as this room, but probably not far off it, where you literally go into miles and miles, shelves and shelves and shelves, and then you go to the next, and there's more shelves of paper. There are 120 million pages of exam answer scripts stored in that plant. Now multiply that roughly times by three, let's say, to include OCR and AQA as well. And, and, and I reckon there's half a billion pages of written exam scripts being stored. Um, so I know this is a little bit of a diversion from what we're talking about today, but I do think this kind of sustainable agenda is, is really important here as well. And add to that the delivery of those oh, exam papers yeah, and the collection. Yes, in exactly. plastic bags. Yes, in exactly. plastic bags. Exactly. By the, by the pallet load. Yes. It's, it's quite my, um, by the way, it's an incredibly efficient system. <laughs> Um, and everything's track and traced and scanned and all the rest of it. But it is, it's actually horrifying when you see what we're doing. It's horrifying. So, so it strikes me that the immediate barrier that we, that we face, you know, we've, we've listened to Tom, we've listened to your sort of policy imperatives here around, you know, let's, let's just get on with it, is in fact the digital divide. You know, we haven't got uh, a nation where all our youngsters have access to a computer, um, leave alone access to internet and time on that computer, even if there's one within the house. But is there something to be said about maybe some savings that come from the analog system to moving towards the digital system? We need to, I think we need to use a sort of, we need to have a blue sky kind of approach to this. So bearing in mind, you've all talked about some of the limitations and difficulties of, of where we are and what, what, what might be the, the issues of, of implementing this overnight. We need to have a vision, don't we, though? We need to have a vision of where we want to get to Mary, you've talked about a time when we wouldn't all be expecting students to sit down at the same point and do their exam, which would get over the issue that Bill mentioned about, you know, are you a summer-born student or an autumn-born student? If we, if we kind of take the brakes off a little bit and go blue sky, where, where would you like us to get to? What might be possible? Um, what might be possible in the future? Wayne, where are we going to go? Well, I, I was sitting here thinking, like, you know, lots of the real um, practical today issues I really don't have a handle on at all and don't pretend to. And I am um, pretty much more thinking of the future. Um, and one of the things I think is really a shame, frankly, um, is when an awful lot of effort goes into um, reproducing what we do at the moment in, in a, a digital form. I don't really see the point in that. There are lots of possibilities that we could do um, to use digital technologies to do something that's different. Um, but that's not happening yet. It, we are very much in the stage of just reproducing what we do, or as I um, typically refer to it as perpetuating poor pedagogic practices. Um, it happens all the time. Um, so for example, examinations. You know, Why do we think that putting an examination online is a good thing? And on the sustainability front, um, the, um, the climate impact of digital technologies is probably far higher than paper for by, by a long, long way. Um, so I don't think that's um, a particularly um, useful approach. But um, I said at the beginning that um, one of the things, and it was mentioned earlier today, the word trust, and I trust teachers. Um, and so instead of um, thinking that we can devise the technologies that will do the assessment on our behalf or that somehow take it out of the classroom 
I just don't think that's possible. And don't get me wrong, you know, I personally have 35,000 word master's level essays that I have to mark in the next um, four weeks. Um, I would love to have a technology that would do that on my behalf. They do not exist, and I promise you they will not exist in my lifetime, not to the standards that we can do. So instead, what about using these technologies to support teachers to do assessment more easily, more effectively? So instead of um, the end of um, year um, examination, I completely agree, you know, I don't like those at all, but what about um, teachers in the classroom um, day in, day out are doing um, assessments of their students while they work in the back of their head, they're not necessarily writing it down. But there are, perhaps there are ways in which we could support that process, make that process more effective, more robust, um, normalising between teachers within the school and within schools and so on and so forth. So actually it's about helping teachers to do the assessments more um, easily, more effectively, more accurately, rather than thinking, and again, you know, over the length of time that um, um, panelists have been saying, rather than thinking we can just um, bring the tech in and it will do everything for us, which it, I, I promise you it won't, not in a long, long time. And if you think about a class of students with 30 students in it and one teacher, then my view would be you should have 31 assessors in the room, i.e. everybody should be involved in assessment all the time, yeah. rather than it being an end piece. Completely agree. Yeah. I mean, you could imagine a tool, and I've seen this um, as a, a, a primitive version of it, where the teacher has an iPad. When the students are working on something, the teacher has two or three minutes spare. You know what I mean? Um, they look at the students in the classroom and they go and run around it very, very quickly. That person green, that person red, that person yellow. Now, that in and of itself doesn't mean a great deal, but it's building upon that teacher's um, implicit knowledge. Um, of the student, of the curriculum, of what happened yesterday, of what that child went through before they came into school, whether they had breakfast, all those myriad things that goes through um, your average teacher's head moment by moment. But then if we just have that one point in time, that's also no good. But if we do that frequently through the week, um, again, the emphasis is not taking up a lot of extra time, but using the technology to support and then that picture that could be built up over the course of an academic year could be very, very um, rich and nuanced, um, far, far from what we have at the moment. So I agree with you. And you, know, you could have the students engage in that. Well, you said I was read today, but actually you didn't realise I was doing this. OK, well, we can shift. Having those kind of conversations facilitated by the technology, not pretending that the technology can do it for us. I'm all for keeping the teacher at the forefront, so that's, that's great. Um, moving on to you, Gabrielle, you talked particularly about inclus inclusion within the work that you're doing. Is there something around the technology that could really give a more inclusive picture of assessment? I do, yeah, a switch to online assessment, I think, is particularly advantageous if you think about inclusivity. I was just looking around this, as beautiful as this room is, I was thinking, what would my PhD student say? Too male, too pale, too stale. And I think when, if we don't belong to a particular group, it's really hard to think about the impact that a physical examination space has on a student. So if you look in my discipline, medical students, they go off to royal colleges that are full of old white male portraiture, and they, have, they sit thinking, I don't belong in this space. It's already having that negative impact on assessment. We teach students who are single parents who've come into medicine, medicine nursing with children who turning up at nine o'clock frazzled having tried to do the school run, get somebody else, drop them at daycare before taking an assessment, sets them up to fail. We've got neurodivergent students. So I think anything that we can use assessment tools and platforms to enhance the student's experience of assessment, and make it seem less punitive and more of an educational experience is a big win. And I think that has to be through the use of technology. But we really need to challenge our colleagues in particular. Because any time I talk about doing something differently, it's, is it reliable? Is it valid? Is it robust? What's the Cronbach's alpha? And we, we think about this very positivist assessment mechanism. Um, so I think trying to challenge people to be more open is probably the biggest challenge we're facing. Brilliant, thank you. All for more openness. Tom, you've, you've already you've talked about the reports you've produced, the sort of agitation to come on, let's get on with it. 
come on, let's get on with it. What are we going to do? How are you going to move it forward? Not that it's all on your shoulders, but... Um, well, I'd love it to be all on my shoulders, <laughs> to be honest. Um, politicians can get this wrong quite quickly, um, which does... It's no, that's no way can find any political party. We have seen a lot of back and forth over a lot of you know, general election manifestos, and I think that really does make trying to persuade politicians much harder. You go back to the last manifesto uh, from the Labour Party for the 2019 general election. They said they were going to get rid of SATs. A lot of people in the profession don't like SATs, and they were very keen with the idea of getting rid of them. However, parents were not very keen about the idea that all of a sudden their kids wouldn't get a test to show what they got by the end of primary school, and they wouldn't be able to find out which of their local primary schools was performing best, and they reacted very strongly against it, to the point where Boris Johnson, before the election, made a big deal out of the fact that the Labour Party were trying to get rid of SATs and indeed get rid of Ofsted as well. So not just stripping away assessment, but also stripping away accountability too. So for us, as I was saying, it's about can we make a case for doing assessment better that brings people with you? And yes, there will inevitably be people who uh, raise a lot of very uh, important questions and important challenges. You know, Mary's absolutely right to focus on the implementation side of things. You need to get some brilliant people around the table to make it happen. But it, is, it always makes you a little bit nervous when someone says, well, we should switch from X to Y. We should switch from written exam to coursework, and that will get us to a better place. Politicians can get very nervous about this stuff because a lot of these things have been tried before. We've got quite good information on where they've been stronger and where they've been weaker. So for me, it's about just building some very sensible conversations and building some very sensible steps, acknowledging that written exams do some things quite well and they do some things quite cheaply relative to other assessments. If you want to find out how well 600,000 people are doing at the age of 16 in their maths, well, actually exams are quite good at that. Other things, other techniques, other tools are not necessarily very well suited to capturing 600,000 people's attainment and progress. So when you want to bring people with you, for us in our work, we're a totally non-political organisation at EDSK, we speak to all the main political parties. For us, it's about building, yes, an evidence-based case for change. And we think that online adaptive testing is absolutely an evidence-based case for change. But it's also about recognising that when you do pull some strings, that something over there that you weren't expecting to move might move at the same time. And that's why we always talk in our reports about assessment and accountability together because they are very, very hard to separate. In fact, I'd never suggest you try and separate them. You probably need to throw in curriculum as well. And then you can maybe just put a, an agenda together, which should not be done quickly. If any politician said they're going to win the next election, within 12 months they're going to put online adaptive testing in place across all primary and secondary schools, I would say please do not do that under any circumstances. Give yourself a bit of space to breathe. Give a sensible evidence-based agenda, which gives, you, gives government what they need, gives parents what they want, gives teachers more space to do what they can do, and I think you can start to bring people with you, but you know, very, very quick movements from A to B, I get very nervous about, so I think, yes, I think we were talking earlier about how many, how many years you might need to implement change, these sort of things, is, is five years too slow, is five years too quick? These are difficult conversations, but I think they are the right conversations. So there's a real need for societal appreciation of the breadth of assessment you know we need the whole country to come and listen to the presentations from rethinking assessment yeah. it strikes me um mary pearson leading the way then um i think i think we are actually i think we are the first awarding body to actually have live um gcse's being uh, tested on screen and digitally and i think that's a huge step forward I would, I would slightly take issue, Wayne, with the idea that there's no point putting analogue stuff online because amongst all the other things we have to think about, we have to think about um, public trust and confidence in the system and we also have to think about the currency of the qualifications or the grades that our students get, the currency of those for progression to further learning or indeed um, to employment. So I'm, pre yeah, on the face of it, why, why would you bother to put analog stuff on screen? And we've, we've kind of seen that along other digital journeys um, over the last few decades. But I, I don't think it's a, it's a bad thing to have got that started. Incidentally, the other thing that I hear from my colleagues at Pearson is that this last summer, over 20,000 candidates submitted 
scripts that they'd written on their laptops, which is, I didn't know this, but apparently it is allowed if that's your normal way of working. You can submit your answer paper as a, as a typescript. Um, and of course, that's um, often important for people with, uh, with disabilities or, or learning differences. Um, so I think this movement is happening. I think young people spend an awful lot of time on their devices. Um, and they find it hard to swap back to pen and paper just for exams. We, we might want to have a conversation about the importance of handwriting itself and how we preserve that when this whole system has gone digital. Um, but I think going, taking people, taking the public, parents, stakeholders, students, teachers, um, on that journey is, is really important. But as others have said, you know, adaptive um, assessment is, uh, is an absolutely, um, I think, a, a massively uh, innovative way forward. Um, and I also think that that paves the way for kind of when ready, stage not age assessment, perhaps even single level tests. So you could say, I need a grade five in mathematics GCSE. I'm gonna take a grade five test not, uh, not the whole thing. Um, picking up, yeah, I'm not in favour of the kind of scrap GCSEs um, agenda, uh, al although I think that may well happen over time. But I definitely think so there's a place, and this is kind of the territory one of your papers was in, Tom, um, in the territory of saying, actually, does everything have to be a high stakes exam? Could we perhaps start instead of everybody taking seven or eight GCSEs? Uh, in, in the summer series, could they perhaps take four or five and then we could have medium and perhaps lower stakes assessments um, for other things and that would provide a, a great kind of sandbox for um, uh, testing and developing <coughs> digital assessments. And of course there's been conversation today about how we allow students to evidence other types of skills and of course a kind of digital environment for that gives huge opportunities to do that. By the way, I'm not hugely in favor of actually testing kind of character traits and aptitudes, because I always wonder what will happen to the poor kids who do badly on teamwork. You know, they might be, they might be very useful for lots of occupations, but I feel that would be a bit dispiriting. Um, and then, uh, you know, so skills portfolios, digital skills portfolios is, um, is a potential huge gain. Um, and of course, masses and masses of lovely, lovely, lovely rich data for us to understand our students better and to understand the validity um, and utility of our assessment items and create better assessments that, that do a better job in assessing the learning outcomes that we uh, are trying to assess. I, I feel at the moment very much that teaching and learning policy, curriculum policy, is enacted through qualifications. So if the government wants us to do something different at school, they change the qualifications. I feel that having more scope for uh, creative assessments would allow us to be in a much better space of saying, this is what we want young people to be taught and to learn. Now, how can we go about assessing that uh, in, a, in a valid and reliable way? I think, that's, I think that's brilliant, and that's probably where we need to end. But that notion of assessment allowing so much more creativity student agency, teacher agency, come to that, within our, our schools and colleges is a prize certainly worth seeking. Thank you very much indeed to the panel um, for your contributions. It's been brilliant to, to hear from you. Thank you very much to the audience. Thank you.